found footage films were a niche genre that exploded in popularity thanks to movies like Wreck, The Blair Witch Project, Paranormal Activity, VHS, and of course the subject of today's scenario, Cloverfield. Capturing the live events of not only a giant monstrous kaiju attacking Manhattan, but the creatures that follow at its wake and what they and their byproducts are capable of, and the origin points of where this all comes from. Not only that, but a very <clears throat> questionable continuity in Connected Universe that expanded into two... <laughs> sequels, with John Goodman becoming John Badman, hiding two prisoners in an underground bunker from an alien invasion, and a multiversal space station fiasco that feels like if 2001 A Space Odyssey and Interstellar tried to be a monster movie with no monsters to speak of. While I loved 10 Cloverfield Lane and Cloverfield, with Paradox just being a disappointment, I have to say none of these movies feel really connected except to appeal to conspiracy and lore goons like me that want a connected universe. Now, if you want a full breakdown, there's plenty of Cloverfield explanation videos here on YouTube. But basically, saying thanks to the events of Cloverfield Paradox and attempting to create an indefinite source of energy from Hadron Accelerator in space, universes started overlapping and sending over creatures and entities between one another, inadvertently causing attacks and apocalyptic scenarios, leading to aliens in 10 Cloverfield Lane and what we are discussing with the Cloverfield monster, and what if it attacked today, and what it could lead to. Honestly, the whole multiverse thing just feels like a lame-ass attempt at bridging together three movies with the same name to garner more views and to make lore nuts like me go nuts. Especially since movies that have no connected universe sequel, prequel, remake, or a reimagining don't really make money or get greenlit by studios at all anymore. That's just the sad reality. But despite its nonsensical connected nature, it's still part of the grander story. But I will only cover events from the first movie and the last 10 seconds of the third movie for this scenario. So, with that being said, today we are discussing why you wouldn't survive a close. Overfield Apocalypse. This story of monsters and parasites dates back to the founding of a mining company by the name of Hand of Power in Kyushu, Japan. The company rose to prominence thanks to innovative drilling techniques. It would see record profits creating space station parts, vehicles, plastics, and procuring oil and other fuels from the 40s to the 70s. That would all come crashing down by 1981, though. Hand of Power would be exposed for numerous exploitative child labor scandals across multiple countries and illegally dumping thousands of gallons of oil in Tokyo's ocean. This, on top of the heavy declination of the mining industry throughout the 1980s, meant Hand of Power would be on the brink of collapse. Instead, though, it would be bought out and restructured into the much more profitable and industrious Tagrido Industries. With their original claim to fame being diverse drilling skills, over a dozen drilling stations would be established worldwide, eventually leading to a radical discovery of a substance referred to as Sea Beds Nectar. Discovered deep in the sea, dead smack on the bottom of the ocean, seabed's nectar would be discerned to have properties with a plethora of effects on human bodies. Company research centers would find out that the nectar, when incorporated into their beverage product Slusho, could have all of these advantageous properties when consumed. We here at Tagrado proudly present to you a drink that can change your life, a delicious cool beverage that can put a pep in your step and some gas in your ass. If you drink Slusho, you can experience the best that American and Japanese drinks can have to offer without the pesky FDA getting in the way. Some of the effects include accelerated cell growth, increased strength, increased soft muscle tissue growth, sharper eyesight, better digestion, smoother skin, and a wave of happiness. Some side effects may include complete and total addiction to Slusho and Slusho products, explosive stomach syndrome, dog-sized parasites capable of eating you alive, unleashing kaiju monsters from the depths of the sea, and destruction of major cities. But in order for it to retain its potency, it must be kept at a near frozen state and to contain it with artificial pressures reminiscent of the ocean floor. Regardless, this drink would be a smash hit for the company. The excessive excavation would also lead to the discovery of a giant extraterrestrial-like creature on the ocean floor with Tagrudo employees monitoring it. The Chuai oil rig station would be established to stand over this monster as a cover-up off the coast of Manhattan in the mid-Atlantic region. However, the entire manned station suddenly fell apart and sank into the sea one day, despite these rigs having been made to withstand 
and the toughest of conditions for even up to 24 hours. All personnel inside would perish with the world thinking it was simply a tragedy at an oil rig. Many would speculate the cause to either be human error, environmental extremist groups, or undersea quakes. Later that night, Manhattan would be delivered a swift blow seemingly out of nowhere. Explosions, rumbles, debris, confusion of whether or not a terrorist attack was being carried out. Buildings, monuments suddenly collapsing left and right. Everyone running, crying, afraid. All while this unseen massive beast is attacking anything in its disoriented state. What would soon be dubbed by fans as simply Clover, this beast would be awakened thanks to the continued upheaval of Seabed's Nectar by Togruto, possibly due to a lack of the substance being around or drilling operations disturbing its slumber, Clover destroyed the Chuai station swiftly and swam to New York in search of food, possibly searching for more of the nectar or just going off hunting instinct. Upon making landshore within the major city, did it display its full capabilities, measuring up to a staggering height, being up to 300 feet tall or 91 meters tall and 1,200 feet lengthwise or 365 meters across at a weight of about 5,800 metric tons. It is very important to note that what the military named it as a large-scale aggressor would be identified as a mere infant. This thing was a child despite having lived for upwards of over 1,000 years in the ocean floor. Its adolescence lent to its first act and behavior on American soul being that of attempting to eat the head of the Statue of Liberty. Thinking the figure was food to eat, only to bite into steel and building materials and chucking the head away in disgust. Flinging the thousands of tons head across Manhattan like it was nothing, showing how insanely strong this beast was. Its anatomy, frame, and body allow it to easily destroy anything and everything around it. Its tail whipping buildings down and collapsing bridges, its mandibles and jaws easily capable of chewing up and eviscerating any biological creatures, from giant whales to horses to people. A non-discriminating diet for any growing boy or girl or them or miscellaneous. A majority of New York would look almost post-apocalyptic within just a few hours of Clover's arrival and the sheer chaotic force by its mere presence. It's important to note that Clover was not aggressive in the vein that an animal is either intimidated or killed for sport or survival. It was simply an animal wandering to open new areas, and it did not determine that human civilization was somewhere to avoid. Knocking over what it perceived to be as just simply giant rocks with flickering lights inside and squashing and eating insects scattered around its feet. It was just looking to migrate elsewhere and eat. Of course, a behemoth causing damage of this magnitude with rising casualties would warrant armed response of the highest caliber. The National Guard and military would swiftly be deployed to the streets of Manhattan to combat this beast, but little could be done to stop it, or hell, even slow it down firing everything we had available from a quick response, from ground troops and vehicles to aerial strikes. After having lived under the extreme pressures of the deep oceans for over a millennia, the dark and gray skin and flesh of Clover proved to be resilient to resist all that we threw at it. Shells from M1A2 tanks and M109A6 Paladins, AT-4 rockets, FGM-148 Javelin missile launchers, AGM-65 Mavericks, and MK-82 bombs and other high-powered ordnance, all making direct contact with Clover. However, none of this caused any physical damage notable to it, only scaring and pissing off the beast and spurring it to do more damage to New York than before, with everything we were throwing at it causing collateral damage around the monster. Think of it like a frightened animal that will go frantic when hurt or fearing for its life. The more we try to fight and kill it, the more it will go ballistic and cause more damage. Nothing will stop it except literally a 
nuke. Clover is not the only threat when it appears though. While it wages an unintended war against our greatest forces, thousands of smaller monsters will be seen lining its body. Dog-sized parasites that either feed on the beast's flesh and blood to survive on the ocean floor, or symbiotic pests that work in tandem with the cloverfield monster in order to keep it alive from smaller threats that it cannot fight back against so that this parasitic species could have continued nourishment and survival. They work together in tandem. Once Clover had dealt with decent enough opposition and felt threatened enough, these legions of parasites would descend from its body to the ground below to begin attacking people and animals alike, attacking anything that is human-sized or lower. Spider-like insectoids that hunt in packs, seeking out prey that Clover could not reach, sprawling into tunnels subways, safe havens, and more. These parasites were looking to consume more so now that they were not sucking on the teat of the beast before, preferring enclosed and dark spaces to easily catch victims off guard. They're able to withstand multiple rounds of gunfire before going down. Their sheer numbers and size could have you dead without even interacting or being near the dominant presence of Clover herself. While just looking at their physiology with their cavernous jaws and sharp and pincers could have you saying, yeah, I'd be dead to that. It's what's inside these parasites that makes them so deadly and horrid. The material of seabed's nectar we discussed previously actually courses through the veins of these very bugs. The parasites will seek to bite and eat victims in order to inject the nectar they hold inside into the bodies of its prey. While beverages widely dispersed by the company had shown to be purely beneficial to those that consumed it in its intended state, Seabed's nectar displayed unknown consequences when exposed to the human body via this giant parasite injection. Possibly due to mutations and interactions within the parasite's body, does the nectar undergo this change, or when not within the harsh environments of deep sea constantly keeping it in freezing temperatures with hellacious pressure down on it, does it display an explosive trait? When not given its original environment to work with, and instead in the belly of a monster, the nectar will immediately start to seep into every molecule of a person's body, causing internal hemorrhaging to excessively build up, causing a victim to go pale, becoming delirious, dizzy, disoriented, and weak. Once blood starts to seep from the eyes and ears of a victim, then the final step of the infection will occur. Many people will suffer this fate of just exploding into bloody bits of shrapnel and guts. Whether or not people popping like meat balloons could prove to be contagious is speculative. It's not outside the realm of reason though. These parasites, if they don't devour you whole, will simply make you explode in a short period of time. In the chaos, of the clover field apocalyptic attacks, if you aren't squashed or eaten whole by clover, blown up in the crossfire, or devoured by starship trooper-like bugs and or exploded, you could possibly be even killed by a loved one that unintentionally left for dead boomered right next to you. The parasites may also be using the nectar in themselves to not hunt prey, but to make all nearby organic life weaker while they are reeling from the initial symptoms so that the giant monster deals with less counter offense. Think of it like pawns being sent out to take care of the opposing forces. Intentional or not, it will be a gruesome sight no matter where you go. The Cloverfield attack would not be ended until the deployment of the hammer down protocol where a nuke was dropped directly on the beast. New York becoming a new Hiroshima to stop a beast that most would never know of its true origins or if there are any more out there or what production methods spurred its creation or awakening. Long-standing implications aside, ramifications of the sheer fact of seabed's nectar being mass-produced and distributed worldwide in slushio products could mean if we defeat anything related to the Cloverfield monster and its parasites, that infections due to improper care of the nectar's unintended side effects could have people exploding in the streets left and right. People that drank it without the proper methods of storage and 
serving could have their abdomens exploding after showing symptoms, with their pustulated innards harnessing a warm and less pressurized environment, gushing outwards and splashing people all around, infecting them, causing more popping people listening to pop music to pop the populace. Swift recalls, quarantine efforts, and more would have to be implemented lest a pandemic of popping people were to expand. But I doubt this would be the solitary scenario. The monster, if left to its own devices or its species being allowed to fully develop, or given more populated numbers, would be a doomsday event unlike any other. The Cloverfield monster being just an infant and the only one ever noted in human history can make it safe to assume that there has to be more out there within the darkened depths of the Earth's seven seas. Presumably, maybe an entire race of these monsters are still lying dormant within the sea near pockets of this seabed nectar keeping them in hibernation. Who is to say? But an entire species being awakened sporadically one day would be game ending just from the sheer damage from the monster attacks, as well as the mutually assured destruction forcing catastrophic collateral damage just to take down one of these. But this is just discussing if every one of these monsters were all, or most of them, just infants. That's infants. We're not even considering the adults. By the end of Cloverfield Paradox, do we get to see the fully grown size and potential of a Cloverfield monster at peak adulthood? even if it were just for a few seconds, as its monstrous frame and roar has it emerging from a billow of clouds like a mountain piercing the sea. Meaning, the adult-sized version, or Queen Cloverfield Monster, can stand anywhere between 6,500 feet or nearly 2,000 meters, all the way up to 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters tall, not accounting for its length or weight, which will be astronomical. An animal of this magnitude would very well shape the planet's environment around it to suit its needs. It took an entire nuke just to kill one infant with New York as a necessary sacrifice. A monster this huge and possibly plentiful in number would not be counterable by any living thing on Earth. Nothing we can throw at multitudes of these could do anything. It could take dozens or hundreds of nukes to take down one beast of the adult size of these monsters. But that would possibly require exhausting all of our ballistic potential just to kill one adult. And that is not even accounting for the parasites that adorn these creatures. The Cloverfield Parasites could possibly do one of two things in this scenario if an adult starts to crop up. They could either A, simply reproduce at a fantastic speed to cover the exacerbated volume of the adult monster's body size to where millions or even billions of these parasites could just rain down on populations once the monster feels threatened or some other type of trigger. Possibly countrysides that the monster can't approach, but tons of these will be attacking. It would be like a locust plague. Or scenario B, the parasites, instead of making better numbers, decide to grow instead to the relative rate of the beast's size. Let's do a little math here. So if the Cloverfield monster is 300 feet and then it became 20,000 feet, this gives it a ratio of a 6,566% increase. Then a parasite with the average height of a dog being about three and a half feet means that these parasites with a 6,566% increase could reach heights of about 230 feet or 70 meters. Parasites becoming literally bigger than 20 story tall buildings just raining down on earth to attack. Although this would be less likely as just the oxygen ratios on earth would say otherwise, but this is a fictional scenario and I'm just doing this for fun, but maintaining a mass population of thousands of creatures of this size, trying to go against that, we would not last. 
It is also very possible in the very least that even if this substance is never discovered in our world, that the events of something like the Cloverfield Paradox could occur, where a rift suddenly opens thanks to either our world or an alternate dimension spurred by hadron accelerators in space forces one or more of the Cloverfield monsters of any shape and size to pour in and begin attacking or even reproducing. Not much we can do to prepare against some Doctor Strange-like portals suddenly appearing one day across the universe and monsters just coming in, or Thanos snapping their way in, or just <laughs> monsters just popping up all over cities, countries, and more else. At least in Cloverfield, some entities around the world knew of one of these monsters' existence. Here, we are completely in the dark and our skirts are getting pulled up before we are just completely blasted. That was a horrible euphemism. I am sorry. It's possible these creatures are indeed extraterrestrial in nature, bridging the connection between them and the alien invaders from Cloverfield Lane. Maybe Clover is a dormant beast they sent ages ago or unleashed on planets to lay waste and come after to clean up and maybe sell the planet on the global black market like some kind of Frieza empire. Who knows with how J.J. Abrams likes to be vague for speculative sake. The aliens in the second film did not display much of their potential, but them swooping in to finalize the human extinction event would be nigh unstoppable. With human numbers whittled down, they would come down and send out highly toxic gases to asphyxiate victims and burn their flesh, plowing through buildings with their giant ships like they were nothing as giant giant tentacles grabbed anything they could to be consumed by the ship's biomechanical frame, scooping up what's left of us for unknown purposes, possibly to convert our bodies into biofuel or to just rid us off the planet to repurpose the world for their own reasons. Regardless, once they have touched down in our atmosphere, it will probably be either in the midst of monster attacks or long after the monsters have raised the Earth. In conclusion, things are pretty definitive for your non-survival in this case. Looking at every variable we have discussed, singular giant infinite monsters attacking and the use of nuclear devices to kill the unkillable beasts means you're going to be crushed by the monster, dying to debris, being eaten alive, being caught in the crossfire of warfare, or having your shadow stay in the concrete in nuclear hellfire. Did you survive all of this or are you too far from the attack zone? Well, parasites can still be scurrying about, possibly multiplying on their own dependent on the environment they find themselves in, leaving you picked apart by canine-sized bugs, or being injected with nectar to pop like a pimple doctor video, or monsters becoming mountain-sized to destroy whole cities with one footstep, like an Attack on Titan rumbling. With monsters this big, the environment changes to adapt to the destruction and leaving us without safety, food, or water, or maybe even air. Then aliens raining in from possible universal portals to finish us all off. And if all else fails in the middle of all peace, and there's no monsters or aliens to speak of, you still explode suddenly from a tasty frozen treat. Anything can happen when the world becomes a clover field, and your luck is plucked when your clover is ripped from the soil. Fucked. That about wraps up this monstrous look at Clover, her many crotch goblins, the implications of bigger clovers and alien invaders and multiple universes that would be unstoppable if allowed to simply exist. Did I get some stuff wrong? Do you think you could survive? What scenarios should I cover in the future? Shout out to Chago aka Quick Flicks for editing today's video together and remember you can be featured on the donator credits here for just chipping in a buck on either Patreon or my YouTube channel memberships. Patrons can see videos up to a week early. Again, if you want to see me cover a scenario, a game, a movie, a TV show, just let me know down in the comments below. Let's have some discussions. Until next time, I'm Zach S, aka Wild Such Gaming. Never forget to stay happy, stay healthy, drink slusho, and never forget to stay well. Wow.